Okay, so um, I think we're probably getting closer and closer to the end of the story now. This is Busby, he's come to join us this week. He's very like Casper. Hey, you. Um, so Lizzie Beth and Casper and Lizzie Beth's mum made it safely onto one of the um, lifeboats, but um, Johnny Trot and Lizzie Beth's dad were sadly in great danger. They were just sort of hanging on to the edge of the boat as it was sinking, so it was quite a scary ending last time. So let's hope their luck turns. <clears throat> it was our blessed good fortune that Mr Stanton and I were on the boat deck at the time the last boat was being lowered. It was not one of the large wooden lifeboats, they were all gone by now, but one of the boats with canvas sides, some 20 or more feet long, with a rounded hull. This one was stored below a funnel, and there were some men trying to manhandle it down onto the deck, a couple of crew among them. One of them was shouting at us, this is the only boat left. This is our chance. We need more hands here. Wading through the water that was waist high by now, Mr Stanton and I and a dozen other men did all we could to help them heave the boat up and over the rail. All of us knew that this was our last hope. How we strained and struggled to launch that lifeboat. But it was too heavy and too cumbersome for us. There weren't enough of us and we were soon very exhausted by our efforts. We couldn't do it. The Titanic was groaning and gaping all about us. She was going at the bow fast. I looked up to see a great wave come rolling along the decks towards us. A lucky wave as it turned out. It swept the lifeboat overboard and we went with it. The shock of the ICC drove all the breath from my body and left me gasping for breath. I remember trying to swim frantically away from the ship and then looking back and seeing one of the huge funnels breaking away and falling down on top of me, toppling like a giant tree. As I hit the water, I felt myself sucked under and swirled away downwards into a whirlpool of such power I was sure it would take me to the bottom of the ship. All I could do was to keep my mouth first shut tight and my eyes open. Suddenly I saw Mr Stanton above me, his feet caught in a rope, he was kicking and struggling to break free. Then, miraculously, I was released from the whirlpool and I found I could swim up towards him. I managed to free him from the rope and together we swam hard for the surface for the light. How deep we were by now, I had no idea. All I knew was I had to swim with all my strength and not to breathe, not to open my mouth. What I learnt that night was what every drowning man learns before he dies. That in the end, he has to open his mouth to try and breathe. That's how he drowns. When at last I had to take a breath, the sea rushed in and choked me. But at that very moment, I broke to the surface, spluttering and coughing the water out of my lungs. Mr Stanton was in the water nearby, calling for me. We saw the upturned lifeboat nearby and we swam towards it. There were bodies in the water, hundreds of them. The cold was cramping my legs, sapping what little strength I had. If I didn't reach the boat, if I didn't get out of the water soon, I would be as lifeless as those bodies all around me. I swam for my life. Oh, those bodies. There were other survivors clambering on to it when we got there. And I couldn't see how there'd be room for us as well. But helping hands hauled both of us up out of the sea. And we joined them there half standing, half laying back against the upturned hull of the lifeboat and then clinging to one another for dear life. Only then did I really begin to take in the horrors of the tragedy that I'd been living through. The shrieks and cries of the drowning were all around me. I caught my last sight of the great Titanic, her stern almost vertical, slipping into the sea. When she was gone, we were left only with the debris of this dreadful disaster strewn all around the ocean and those terrible cries that went on and on. And there were swimmers in the sea all around us, every one of them it seemed heading our way. Very soon we were swamped with them and we were turning them away, yelling at any others who came near that there was no room. And that was true. 
horribly true. Okay, there's a picture. I'm just going to cover up this bit. There we go. People trying to turn the boat up the right way up so they can uh, climb into it. It's terrible. Sorry, bad choice of books made me feel sad. The buoyancy of thank you, Busby. The buoyancy of our boat was already under threat. We were low in the water as it was, and all of us would be lost if we took on any more. What I have never forgotten is that even in their desperate plight, many of those swimmers seem to understand the situation perfectly and accept it. One of them, and I recognised him as one of the stokers I'd worked alongside, said to us, his voice shaking with cold, All right then, lads, good luck, and God bless you. And with that he swam off in among the bodies and the chairs and the crates. And disappeared. I never saw him again. I will carry to the grave the guilt of what we did to that man and to so many others. Like so many survivors, I have lived through that night out on the open ocean in my dreams again and again. Mr Stanton and I did not talk much, each of us too busy with our own doubts and dreads, too busy just surviving. But side by side we endured together. I know that for me it was memories that kept me going. And I think I relived most of my life that night. Harry the cockroach in its matchbox. The Countess Kandinsky sweeping into the Savoy in her ostrich feather hat. Taking her bows at the opera that night. Casper curled up on the piano as she sang. Elizabeth beaming up at me as she fed him his liver. Elizabeth on the roof of the Savoy. Lizzybeth and her mother in the light boat with Casper hidden in the blanket. Around us the ocean was silent and empty now. There were no more cries for help, no more last messages to mother, no more appeals to God. We looked and we never stopped looking for the lights of a ship on the horizon that might bring us some hope of rescue. Our lifeboat had floated away from all the others by now. And from all the wreckage that had littered the ocean, we were quite alone and quite helpless. From time to time, one of our number, there are about 30 of us, I think, said the Lord's Prayer. But for the most part, we were silent. The growing fear for all of us as the night passed was the sea itself. At the time the ship went down, the ocean was completely calm, just as it had been ever since we left Southampton. But now all of us could feel that a swell was building and we all knew that if the waves worsened our fragile craft would be bound to sink beneath us. Sleep too was a danger. Already one of the older passengers had simply fallen asleep and slipped into the sea. He went down without a struggle and I saw him go. I knew then very soon that I would be going the same way. I wasn't afraid of dying. Not any more. I just wanted to get it over with. Often I felt coming over me an irresistible wish to surrender myself to sleep, only for Mr Stanton to shake me back to my senses. Oh, buzz bees. Oh. It was Mr Stanton, too, who first saw the lights of the Carpathia. His cracked voice shouted it to the rest of us. Some did not believe it at first because the rise and fall of the swell intermittently hid the lights from us, but soon they were quite unmistakable. A great joy surged through every one of us, giving us new strength and new determination. Not that any of us cheered, but when we looked at each other now, we could manage a smile. We knew that we had the chance to survive. Those lights of hope, lights of life, for that's what they were for us drove away the darkness of our despair and the agony of the cold too. I'll show you that picture. There they are, look. You can see the light of the boat come in. Mr Stanton's arm came around my shoulder. I knew he must be hoping what I was hoping for, that his wife and his daughter, and Casper, might be there on the Carpathia and safe. We did not know it at the time, 
but we were the last survivors to be picked up by the Carpathia. I went up the rope ladder ahead of Mr Stanton. My legs were so weak that I wondered, often as I climbed, whether I would make it or not. I could see that hands were gripping the ladder, but I couldn't feel them. It wasn't strength that got me up that ladder. It was nothing but the will to live. Then, with Mr Stanton and all the others from the lifeboat, we were taken below to, into the warm, given dry clothes and swathed in blankets. We were sat there drinking warm, sweet tea, and it has been my favourite drink ever since. Bit of a relief, that was a bit harrowing for a minute. We'll leave it there, I think. Sorry. That was Casper.